This is the Middle Earth Philosopher, where I took a look at ideas, people, and relationships within Middle Earth and tried to examine them from a philosophical point of view that could have existed in the world at that time. The Doors of Middle Earth are often spoken of as a second tier race, and not part of the larger schemes that play out in that world. There's no grand spiritual plan at play with them, and in fact they are literally an accident from when the Vala Aole created them and the Yuvatar discovered this and yet mercifully granted them life. Nor do they seem to be a major power player or target for orcs or men or evil Valar or elves for large parts of the history, though this changes somewhat during the second and latter part of the Third Age. So how does this treatment, this view, come to affect the philosophy of the dwarves? And is that view responsible for any of these perceptions that people have of them? Well, I think there are a couple of different ways that we can take the philosophy of the dwarves from these perspectives. To start with, there are many different clans of dwarves that live in Middle Earth. From the west of Beleriand when it existed, to the far east of Middle Earth. Of these, only three or four of them are well known, with the clans in the east being heard of very little. The main clan, of course, is that of Durin, who lived in Khazadun from the First Age up until the Third Age. In the west of Middle Earth, in Beleriand, there were three major dwarf clans, though that quickly dropped to two. The first being the petty dwarves that had delved the caves of Nargothrond before the elves took it over. And then there are those that lived in the Blue Mountains, in the cities of Belogost and Nogrod. These are the clans that are spoken of in the histories of Middle-earth for any good portion of their stories. And in general, there are some philosophical views that tend to be very similar and run through all dwarven clans. For one thing, they seem to suffer from a Napoleon complex. That is, they demand respect from anyone who deals with them. And to offend them is not only taken as a major offense, but as a grudge that can be held for a very, very long time, and taken to an extreme, can lead to an all-out war. And speaking of war, that is another major characteristic that they are known for, being very warlike despite their smaller size. In this arena, the dwarves are considered renowned because of their strength and their renown for making weapons and armor, often considered only second if not equal to the Noldor, who were considered the greatest craftsmen in Valinor in the west. However, even above this is their gift and ability to carve out huge cities and mansions underneath the earth and in mountains and caves, creating strongholds that can last for whole centuries and hold off entire armies. Within these halls, they are known for making jewels and other kinds of metalwork that are considered highly valuable and often very long lasting, able to last for centuries long after those who made them had died. The last common trait that they share is that they also tend to be very secretive about their cultures. It is said that the doors never share their actual names with outsiders, and that the names that they give to outsiders, humans, hobbits, elves, and what have you, are actual names that are just for them to use when in their presence. But beyond that, it's unknown. Dwarves as a race are very proud of their heritage and their culture as well, and hold themselves second to none, no matter who they may might be. And because of this, insults are taken very, very personally, and they are absolutely followers of the adage, an eye for an eye, though they will probably add to it that if you piss them off enough, it might also be a hand, an arm, or just a whole head. Though this temperament can vary from clan to clan, it still exists in one form or another, and depending on which person or situation tends to set it off. Having said these things though, because of the different locations, errors, and circumstances that they lived in, each clan of dwarves had their own nuance to their philosophies that tended to diverge from each other. Some of those differences being very small, that you probably would not recognize and easily gloss over if you weren't looking for it. And others are very distinct. To start with, I'm going to look at the petty dwarves of the first stage, who were by far the most extreme of any of the dwarven clans in my opinion. They were the most secretive of any of the known groups, and this was largely due to their negative experiences that they lived under during the first stage. According to Meme, one of the last known survivors of the clan, they lost out in a war with one of the other clans, 
either Norgrod or Belagost or maybe even both. Who's to say? They were then hunted by the Sindar elves because they were not recognized as sentient or intelligent and were just considered hostile. At some point, as I said earlier, they created the caverns of Nagarthon, but because the numbers were so few, they pretty much became an endangered species and then eventually extinct thanks to the men Huron and his son Turin. These conflicts with other races and their own people made the Petty Doors very bitter towards outsiders and very prejudiced as well. And while it sounds like they had the warlike nature in the beginning, their mounting losses over time seems to have driven that trait out of them, instead taken to be much more secretive. This is unusual for dwarves, as, as I mentioned earlier, they are very loud and prideful about their race and their clan, and the petty dwarves certainly have that aspect, but by the time of their meeting with Turin's warband, it didn't really even matter. Still, they respected the ways of their culture, such as the idea of recompense of loss, and therefore respected any others who demonstrated similar dwarven qualities. However, just like other traits, they had an extreme level of hatred for obvious reasons, and to the point where it could turn into malice, and arguably you could say evil, willing to betray even their own allies if they in turn felt betrayed by them. As I mentioned before, everything about the petty dwarf worldview was extreme. They felt cursed in a way, or perhaps cheated out of the prosperity granted or earned by other peoples in Belagos and Norgrod, whom they probably fought with earlier on. So an extreme clan with extreme views that met an extreme end in extinction, very tragically. Norgrod, as for mentioned earlier on, was one of the more prosperous clans and lived in the Blue Mountains, often mentioned in the same breath as the other dwarven city, Belagos. They could be secretive regarding their inner motives and their culture, but were also much more outgoing than the Petty Dwarves. They traded with the Sindar Kingdom of Doria for centuries before being deceived by their own to go to war with them, and they also had alliances with the Noldor Elves of East Beleriand that lived under the rule of Karanthir. In fact, the survival of the Sindar during their first age is largely due to their association with these dwarves because of the armor that they made and that they gave to them. These interactions with other races also made their views of them also more nuanced. Up until their war, Norgrod dwarves seemed to have fairly positive views of the Sendar, thanks in large part, it seems, to their Maiar queen, Melian. While there was some off-putting over their mutual appearances and how they saw each other, they still shared some parts of each other's culture, and they had even fought together in multiple wars. So even though there was some animosity, there was no open hostility for a very long time. This contrasted somewhat with their relationship with the Noldor, which appeared to be much more begrudging, though not violent as well. Given that the Noldor, under the sons of Feanor, were the most proud and haughty of the Eldar, they were probably also probably the more prejudiced, and thus, if Coranthir is anything to go by, were much more outspoken of their opinions about Dwarven appearances compared to their own Eldar heritage. Not exactly the best way to establish a trusting relationship, and nowhere near as respectful in empathy like Melian of the Sindar was. Yet despite that, they did develop some commonalities, and learned to empathize with each other when it came to their religions and their crafting and weapons making. If anything, the Nordar respected good metalwork, and that they shared the religion with Ale was another plus even though the Nordor actually had first-hand experience with the Vala, and whereas the Dwarves had just heard of him as a rumor and maybe even a myth at that point. So therefore, they were willing to ally with Mahedros and Karanthir up until the point where they were driven out of the Eastern Beleriand after the Battle of Unnumbered Tears. Something to note, however, is that Nogrod is often associated with bad circumstances and characters as well. Ael, the Sindarin noble who was noted for his dark tendencies and malicious personality, spent much time with them, and was taught by the Nogrod masters as well in metalwork. And moreover, their war with the Sindar began when some of their craftsmen lied to them regarding the circumstances of the death of some of their number, as well as the death of the High King Thingol, and their attempt to steal the Simurils from them. This war also reveals another nuance in the Nogrod worldview 
in that they are more wrathful than the doors of Belagost, who have wanted to reason what happened before going to war. However, the Norgard doors absolutely refuse this and win it alone. These reputations merit the possibility that the Nagrod Dwarves may have had a low-key darker tendencies than other dwarves overall, or even just a more natural bent towards quote-unquote evil acts, even though not wholly crossing over like orcs do. The Dwarves of Belagost share much of the same history and traits as those of Nogrod, so there's not much point going over that again. Rather, I want to hit on their nuances. Without outright saying so, Belagos is implied to be the nobler of the two clans. When Nogrod wanted to ally with them to go to war with the Sindar, Belagos hesitated, wanting to reason out what happened first because of the suspicious circumstances rather than make a rash mistake with their allies. Perhaps a bigger statement to this point though, however, is during the Battle of Unnumbered Tears that it was the King of the Doors of Belagost who had pretty much defeated the dragon Glaurong, even though this also resulted in his death. And this was no small feat either, given that Glaurong was rather infamous among the elves for burning his way through everything, and being near unstoppable on top of that. And it was Glaurong who led the assault against the Beleriand Alliance during that battle that broke it apart and focused on the eastern half that just about destroyed that entire faction as well as nearly killing all of the Sons of Feanor. Also, this major event of the First Age reveals a key aspect in the philosophy of the Belagos Dwarves, given that their high regard for their kings is unparamount. It is not recorded anywhere else where an army will stop in mid-battle to take away their fallen king, much less their allies not questioning what the hell they're doing leaving the battle so early because of potential fear that they may just turn on them as well. Without a doubt, the most famous Dovran clan is that of Durin, which is considered the most prosperous and most involved and arguably the most enlightened of any of the dwarves throughout the first, second, and third age. I'm going to refer to them as the Khazad dwarves just for easier reference, since the name of their realm is called Khazad-du. Though having been in existence since the first age, khazad doesn't come into its own, I think, until the second age. These doors are by far the most extroverted of the race, even more so than their first age peers. They took in refugees from the fallen cities of Belagost and Nogrod at the end of the first age, and from this mass migration, it is presumed that their numbers began to swell, and not only that, they were also bringing into their knowledge the smith work and knowledge that they, that they accumulated during the first age from the Noldor and the wartime experience, since the Wars of Belaroyand never got as far as east of the Blue Mountains. Furthermore, however, and arguably most importantly, they interacted openly with the Noldor of the Second Age, creating a bond between the two civilizations that was so strong that they were considered more friends than just trading partners or wartime allies. And this is a major departure from the Dwarves of the First Age, given that even though they were trade partners and military allies, at no point did they really consider any of the elves their friends. They assisted the Noldor during the war with Sauron, particularly when he sacked their city of Eregion, and from some sources I read, presumably helped the survivors get to the east of the Misty Mountains, traveling through khazad safe from Sauron's armies. Not only that, but they also actively participated in the War of the Last Alliance that closed out the Second Age, fighting alongside the Elves and humans as well. Now, there's a lot to impact here regarding their views on the world. Their actions during the Second Age implies that the Khazad Dwarves were much more enlightened in terms of how they got along with others, but were also more aware of world events as well during that time, so they weren't as, per se, secretive or isolationist as they later became. It also speaks to how much they were respected by humans and Nordor elves at the very least during that era. khazad was not some little-known city of a little-known race during that time. They were world merchants, a world power that was respected by humans and Nordor elves at the very least. And those that forgot this, in this case Sauron, usually paid a heavy price for it as well. Sauron had to expend great effort to resist the might of the dwarves 
before he was finally able to drive them back when they closed off Gaza Doom on its western side. Moreover, when Sauron was trying to corrupt the races of Middle Earth, it said that he never could corrupt the dwarves entirely, and that the only thing that really happened and eventually did cause much destruction and chaos among them was that they became more greedier, but never became slaves of Sauron. So you can say that the Khazad dwarves were the most developed and probably the peak of all dwarven civilization that existed. And in a way, you probably could compare it to Numenor for the humans as well. That being said, however, it is during the Third Age where things took to take a turn for the worst, beginning with the fall of Khazad Doom to Durin's Bane, a Balrog from the First Age, that drives the dwarves from their homeland and kills their High King as well. This loss of not just their ancestral home, but also their seat of world power makes them migrate to other mountain ranges, the Blue Mountains, the Grey Mountains, Erebor, the Iron Hills, and so on. And their work after that seems to be a far cry from their glory days, to the point where, to many people, they seem just like toys makers and minor craftsmen, if anything. Indeed, every time they try to establish themselves, it seems like another calamity occurs often wars with dragons, who then promptly steal that home and their gold while killing even more of their kind, and occasionally even come into conflict with, with humans as well, given that they take or demand their wealth and work for themselves. And I think this is where they start to follow the same path as their ancient but scarcely known ancestors of the Petty Dwarves from the First Age. Their worldview, once extroverted and I guess you could say friendly and outgoing, ready to assist others in a time of need, shifts into bitter loathing, paired with a sense of sorrow and sadness that they only share among each other because of the fallen state of their people. It would be like in real life if the United States or Great Britain went from a superpower to being something along the lines of the Sudan or the Rohingya Muslims over in Southeast Asia. And by the way, if I mispronounce any of that, you have my apologies. But Moving on. These calamities made the dwarves much more defensive about their self-identity and much more possessive about their works. It also exaggerated their famed tempers and warlike nature. While not descending so far as to hate other races, like the petty dwarves, they did become far more distrustful of them. And to outsiders, the dwarves seemed more greedy and just less kind than normal. This all blows up in everyone's faces during their war with the orcs. And I think this point can't be emphasized enough that this is Tolkien's one mention of a literal race war in Middle-earth. Let me reiterate that. Two different species were hell-bent on completely annihilating the other from existence, something that didn't even happen during the First Age. And I would like to suggest that this was not just because a descendant of Durin was killed. Rather, I think it was a culmination and embodiment of the rage and the sorrow that the Khazad-dwarves felt for the calamities during the Third Age, given that one of Durin's line was killed in his very ancestral home by an orc who, by any rights and under normal circumstances, would no way in hell have gotten near there, much less within khazad Doom itself. And this simulation, and as well as all the other simulations, was something that the Khazad Dwarves could not let stand. And what this war effectively does is show the Dwarves at their very worst, and fully actualizes their darker tendencies that was more or less implied to different degrees by different clans and different eras. The fall of Doriath has nothing on this particular conflict, and even that was bad. The War of the Dwarves and Orcs is both their highest and lowest point with them nearly wiping out every orc that lived in the Misty Mountains. Still though, after this particular event, things slowly seem to start to improve. Erebor, one of their most important strongholds after the fall of khazad which had also been taken by a dragon, falls back into dwarven hands, whom along with the khazad dwarves in the Iron Hills, once again becomes a powerhouse in that region of Middle-earth, and also working alongside of, with humans during the War of the Ring fighting alongside them when Sauron invades that land. That being said, however, the worldview doesn't quite recover the same way it did like it, like it was during the Second Age. 
So these are the nuances that I see in the philosophies of the different Dwarven clans and the eras in which they lived in and how it affected them and how they affected it. Clearly there are some overlaps and even some repeating elements that occur, but none are exactly alike and both are, as I said before, informed by and inform their interactions with the outside world and those in it.